things they don't tell you about electric motors. Today's episode is brought to you by engineering.com, a globally trusted source for engineering content. Check out this and many other videos for the engineering professional on engineering.com TV today. If you work in manufacturing, you've seen these, a lot of these. For about a century, AC induction motors, well, they've been the motive power of choice for industrial machinery, large and small. These things revolutionized industries and they really made the modern world possible. They have about the same level of impact in society that cell phones and internet have had today. These things built the industrial world, but it's not uncommon for even the smallest operations to have dozens of these with thousands in a large factory. Now, if you're as lucky as I was in working in factory operations, including MRO before moving into the engineering office, you pick up a few insights that you don't learn in the classroom. Here are a few tips that the old timers taught me that I think are still relevant today. One, older motor designs are stronger than today's units. Well, not in my experience. It was certainly heavier for a given rating and frequently used larger bearings, but the dirty secret of most electrical devices in industry is that the, the real enemy is heat, more accurately, heat rise. Older equipment designs before finite element analysis and advanced simulation, well, they were designed very conservatively and motors were commonly overrated. Modern equipment is designed with just enough motor for the job and they're spec'd to operate with exactly the duty cycle that the machine design is expected to demand. If a drive motor, for example, operates at a 40% duty cycle and some smart young guy finds a way to hot rod the rest of the system to make it run faster, asking that motor to run at a 50 or 60% duty cycle will cause a failure. Do not ask me how I know this. Now in that case, the only solution is to operate the motor, which generates its own set of problems. Sealed bearings are just as good as greasable bearings. Now I know that people in the bearing industry will fight me on this, but I really wish that small motor community down at the fractional level would put the Zerks back on electric motors. Yes, it was an ugly entry-level job for the rookie kid in any mill writing shop, but the ability to grease motor bearings externally has three major advantages. One is that seals are imperfect and it ensures that there's always a plentiful supply in the bearing. Second is that it flushes contaminants like dust and moisture that make it past the seals out of the bearing. And also as importantly, it gives you a reason to get up close and personal with the motor on a regular basis. Cracks, loose tie bars, corroded connections, frayed insulation, clogged ventilation, these are all things I've seen while digging for that awkwardly placed fitting. Now, if you're a smaller shop that doesn't have the advantage of a major oil company setting up a computer-driven lubrication program for you, the general rule of thumb for electric motors is an LGA grade two for greases in horizontal shaft mountings and grade three for vertical configurations. And greases without extreme pressure additives, well, they last longer in this application, so keep a separate gun for those hypoid gear sets. You can't maintain electric motors. Well, in a sense, that's true, and that for most applications, they run until they don't, then they're swapped out and sent out of shop for a rebuild. Now, in my experience, even a simple contactor set or start capacitor may be no easier to replace than the entire motor, especially if it's connected to the driven shaft with a flex coupling. In a lot of cases, the MRO strategy is to determine if an in-house spare is needed for critical applications or if the unit can be procured off the shelf from a local jobber. If your equipment is American-made, this is usually easy, but there are some European and Asian machines out there that use non-standard frames, which can cause some real engineering problems when the production manager demands an improvised fix with the wrong motor. Now, you can make it work, but in many applications, a Millerite may have already addressed a twisted frame or soft foot by shimming the motor for alignment. Now, you may be able to make another motor work, but don't be surprised if you encounter vibration problems even after alignment. Is it worth it to accept downtime and the cost of FedExing an original motor to a custom shop for a rewind? Well, I think so. Preventative maintenance programs and predictive analytics that use algorithms to plot the mean time between failures and failure probabilities of equipment, well, this has made MRO and factories easier. But I think it's taken some of the romance out of the job. If I was starting in a smaller operation right now, these two tools are the things that I would use more than anything else. The laser thermometer, well, it lets you zap a motor housing or gearbox coupling and definitively know what you're up against. And it's a lot better than spit or a temperature crayon. And this, the mechanic's stethoscope, well, it used to be common in shops everywhere. There's still no better way that I know of of knowing that a bearing is on the way out early enough to avoid surprises. By the time you can hear it by ear, you're already running out of time. Now I could go on like this for hours, but if you're a manufacturing SME and your MRO program consists of one or two grim-faced people with dirt under their fingernails, remember this. A clean, properly aligned motor with tight mountings and run at no more than the design load and duty cycle should be the least of your maintenance problems. If you do it right, the most common tool you should see in your mechanic's hands is a shock vac.